So, post cap recap. So, many of you know SOCAP is the world's leading conference, not just their words, but actually leading conference on activating the power of capital markets to drive positive social and environmental impact. They convene impact investors, social entrepreneurs, philanthropists, business leaders, and other innovators from across the world in a unique cross-sector approach to catalyze collaboration for change. What was exciting for me and for Alicia is going up there in this 10th year, um, SOCAP attracted over 3,000 people to their 10th anniversary event, and also as a decade has passed, it was a really nice way to think about the history of impact investing um, over the past 10 years and also going forward. Okay. Um, I'm going to make sure that Alicia can speak. I don't know how to function. Sorry, one second. Right. So that said, why were we at SOCAP? As I figure out which one is Alicia to unmute. Oh, there you are. Unmute Alicia. There you go. Alicia, do you want to jump in and share why you went to SOCAP? muted. She should be able to speak. Well, can't hear Alicia quite yet. In the meantime, I'm Warren. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at Mission Driven Finance. Um, we're an impact investment intermediary that grew out of conversations that we've been having at San Diego Impact Investors Network. I'm also on the steering committee of that and convene Social Venture Partners Impact Investing Spark Team. Um, so I, I went up. I was excited to look into what's happening in local place-based impact investment ecosystems and initiatives and particularly excited about blended finance structures, bringing in philanthropic capital as well as more retail investors so that we can get um, – all sorts of folks aligning their social and financial motivations to unlock more change. General trends in the investor space, and I don't follow that all the time, um, see what's happening in worlds that I don't usually tap into, and then what some of the things are that other folks have been grappling with to create more equitable and just economic structures. Do I have Alicia now? Hi, can you hear me, Lauren? There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. Want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia Quinn. I am Director of Programs for Mission Edge. We are a San Diego-based um, social enterprise, 501c3, that provides strategic and operational support to nonprofits and social businesses in a number of areas. Um, I'm also consulting with San Diego grant makers to help them design and execute their annual conference, which will be held at the end of March um, 2018. Um, I also serve on the board of the USD Center for Peace and Commerce, um, which hosts the um, Global Social Innovation Challenge. Um, my areas of, of interest um, are supporting social entrepreneurs, um, corporate engagement, we do a lot of work here at Mission Edge with um, corporations such as Qualcomm to engage their employees um, in the community and to further philanthropy um, and, and social impact. Um, and then also, um, I'm really interested in, in trends in equity and uh, racial equity in particular. Um, and so those are three of the, the areas that I um, kind of focus on as far as content uh, at SoCal. Thanks, Alicia. And Alicia and I both were going for the first time, so had a lot of 
eye-opening experiences. There are 3,000 people and most of them extroverts. It can be a little bit overwhelming, but I think both of us had a really enjoyable time despite the smoke. Absolutely. All right. So 10 years. Um, this was something that I hadn't really registered before going, um, but impact investing was a term that was coined in 2007 by the Rockefeller Foundation. This is really to um, describe something that was starting to happen, that there's trends and little seeds of it for a long time, but 10 years ago it really became a term and started having rigorous analysis around it. Um, as well, in 2008, we had the start of the financial crisis. Lehman Brothers was in the process of folding. Um, and we found thousands of professionals in financial services were either out of work or grappling with a sense that traditional finance had betrayed not just them and their clients, but also the values that they based their professional careers on. So the conveners of SOCAP 10 years ago said, let's break down this thought of two-pocket thinking where you have one pocket for profit and one pocket for philanthropy or aid that does good and that these pockets never mingle. The, the three founders believe that not only should these pockets be intertwined and, and um, not completely separate, but that there should be just one pocket and that social change could and would increase their quote unquote, pocket change. Um, Ten years ago, this seemed like crazy talk, and now it's gaining wide adoption. So some of the thoughts that were circulating as people were reflected on the past 10 years and looked forward to the next <coughs> 10 years is that this, became, this is becoming um, more urgent, that this is all of our work. Ross Baird is the CEO of Village Capital that does a ton of impact investing. And Ross said, you know, when he first started attending in 2009 in the second year, he didn't think that, and the attendees at that time wouldn't have thought that devastating forest fires, an island completely without electricity in the United States, and rampant inequality would be where they were nine years later. But this work is urgent and important, and we need to mobilize more capital for change. And then Bain Capital is one of the elephants in the room. They've created a large impact investment fund. It's becoming more mainstream. And what their senior impact associate was saying was that is as this becomes more mainstream, we're going to need to look at new ways to invest in mainstream companies. So it's going to be a little bit awkward as we're teenagers now. We're going to be trying new things, deciding, you know what, that doesn't work. But 10 years from now, we expect it to be a lot more formalized and um, even more widely adopted than it is now. Alicia, any other 10-year thoughts from you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that just the, the overall tone um, of the of the SOCAP conference was really reflecting on how far um, impact investing has come in, in the past 10 years, um, but also forward thinking and saying, okay, what's, what's impact investing 2.0 or 3.0? Um, so it was really interesting to sort of reflect on uh, what's been done to this point, but then also to um, really have some, some deep conversations about moving forward and what um, what is it going to take for impact in investing to, to get to the next level. Excellent. So biggest takeaways, I really loved along that same theme that Alicia was just talking about. Morgan Simon is one of the co-founders of um, Tonic, which is a global in impact investors network, and Transform Finance. And she says, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. We should absolutely keep trying to get a product out there and, and have a minimal viable product, but also don't let good be the enemy of perfect, that we should continue to strive for more and better, and that we have currently some small bespoke solutions to enormous global challenges and that we can keep trying to 
have stronger impact, stronger metrics, stronger measurement, and ways to en engage a wider audience in mobilizing capital for change. Um, some of that is that mainstream, mainstreaming has some growing pains. It's not easy. There's uh, some tensions between community finance and um, Bain Capital and TPG's Rise Fund, which has several billion dollars. Um, but that if we all remember why we're here, why we do this, why we believe this is important, this is actually so caps tagline is the intersection of money and meaning. So if we remember the meaning of why we're here, then that will help us to really work together to unleash more good. And then there, I think some of the other big takeaways for me was how, how big of a focus there was on this concept of palliative versus transformative, where we're seeking to address root causes. We're trying to break down systems that have created inequitable structures or have created the problems that we see in the world. We don't want to keep replicating the things that have made the problems that we see now as we try to fix them. So I think that was, that was heartening for me is to hear so much of this really challenging work to dig into what are the root causes of some of the, these things. Um, we'll get into a little bit more in neighborhood economics and racial equity, but those are, those are the biggest pieces for me. And I'll move on to Alicia. Yeah, I think a lot of, um, a lot of the takeaways that Lauren just shared, um, I definitely share those as well. Um, additionally, you know, one of the opening plenaries um, was Sarah Miller from F.C. Heron Foundation, and she was really talking about how, um, you know, we, we really must stand vigil, and we must continue to, um, to move forward, and we must continue to push the envelope and be progressive in um, not just our thinking and our talking, but in, in our, our actions and our performance. Um, and, and she said, you know, we really lose moral high ground if we don't connect money with mission. And when we're looking at impact investing, in particular, or just philanthropy overall, um, we need to infuse that as a really as a way of life, and to um, sort of align our our personal our personal values with our with our institutional with our investments. Um, they're not mutually in exclusive. Um, another big takeaway that I found in in both the impact investing as well as the the equity sessions that I attended. Um, that there's really a need to create proximity and be in the communities um, before driving policy and to really leverage um, the voice and the knowledge um, and the experiences and the assets of the community that you're trying to impact. So um, there was a lot of talk about, you know, investing in grassroots organizations um, who have boots on the ground, um, investing in uh, in startup entrepreneurs and not just providing them with the capital, but also, you know, collaborating with them to better understand what are the needs of the community and to listening and, and to listen to them as, um, as you create solutions um, and, and investment strategies. Well said. I think absolutely those are right on track with everything that I went to. Um, so SOCAP has several different tracks that they center their programming around these themes. And Alicia and I went to overlapping but not all the same sessions. Um, I could read you everything that these themes mean. You pretty much understand um, climate change and education. We didn't go to actually anything about climate change or beyond aid, so these are, these are your options that we'll be talking about today. <laughs> um, neighborhood economics, really briefly, it, this is about the place-based investments and, and thinking about structures that create um, sustainable ecosystems in local areas. Sustainable livelihoods is the future of work. That's not necessarily immediately apparent from their cute little icon. Um, the Good Capital Project is um, a project that I've been involved with. This is run by SOCAP, and it's addressing six main challenges to main, mainstreaming impact investing. So 
instead of having that out separately, we just lumped it in with impact investing, what are some of the trends in general. So just giving you a heads up of what we're going to dive into. So this is meaning, and I wanted to just share really quickly two minutes of this extremely powerful um, video. And hopefully the sound comes through for you. Um, this beautiful poet, Sonia Renee, opened up the sessions on Tuesday evening and just brought the house down. We can't have this conversation about how we fund social impact, how we fund movement without talking about the heart, about talking about our heart and where we allow our heart to lead our resources, our time, our money, right? So I'm going to ask you all to do an activity for me. I'm, I'm, I don't really, I'm not so much this conference -y kind of girl. I'm going to ask you to do some unconference -y things. Is that okay? Awesome. So I'm going to ask you, if you have something in your hands, you'll probably need to put them down, a super connected human being, connected to digital things more than we are connected to each other, right? So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to put your hands together and rub them together and create some friction with your hands. Right? And when that hand feels really warm, I want you to place it on your heart. And I want you to let yourself be present to your heartbeat. Let yourself be present to this, this muscle inside of each of us that ought to be where we do this work from, that ought to be what leads us to how we spend our money, how we spend our time, who we see, who we do not see. And with your hand on your heart, I want you to just be with me for a moment. Take a moment and consider, how did you get here? Yes, here in that chair, but also a here that is beyond a finite point on a map. Not the registration table at SOCAP, but here as in this particular junction of your heart. How did you become part of this contagious epiphany called impact? In a garden overwrought with the weed of greed, how have you held the tiny bud of your, of your humanity intact? So that was Sonia Renee, and hopefully that sound actually came through. I have no idea which speakers are doing what. Um, but it was really, I think, embodied this sense of meaning and also shows the huge variety of participants and practitioners that were here, that we had a strong black woman poet who has raised, she said, $43,000 compared to um, 1.3 million for failed startups, mostly run by white men, um, but she was one extreme and then the senior impact associate at Bain Capital in his three-piece suit is, an, is another extreme, but that they shared the same stage. Um, but Sonia Renee, I think, really called us out and said, remember that impact is personal. Each of us have a different set of values that we believe in and that we choose to activate our capital for, whether that's philanthropic capital, financial capital, um, human capital of our time. Um, just think about what, what are those personal values that help us to understand our relationship to our money and more than our money, our time and our energy. Some of the other things that really resonated for me around meaning were folks asking, talking more about that relationship with money that it's not just personal, but it's also cultural, and that um, great thought leader Joel Solomon was saying that we've accumulated wealth in a way that has created disparities, but we have been fixated for the last 40 plus years with this idea of the infinite accumulation of wealth that there's never a point where we feel like we have enough. You've got a house, you've got clothes on your back, you've got your kids have a good education, but we keep trying to get more money. And some of it is rooted in fear. Um, but if we don't have enough money, 
stored up for a rainy day that may never come that we might go back to a standard of living that we didn't we don't want to have and that we strove to get out of strove that word strove <laughs> oh side note there um but that this, this fear, this understanding of our own relationship to money and, and what does enough mean helps us to understand, you know what, I'm good with what I have and I am okay with investing and unlocking things that are sitting in this bank account and helping more good happen for other people who might be in that space where I tried to get out of and I have gotten out of. Uh, the one wonderful philanthropist who was in the room with me at the time asked, how do we support this philosophical turning of the corner? How do we activate more people to lead with their hearts when they're used to leading with a spreadsheet? Uh, how do you help people to understand what's possible if they let go of some of these assets? Uh, and wonderful people at um, RSF Social Finance said, Hearing from their peers to let go of the fear and how, they, how we've been socialized to think about money is a huge piece. They convene small peer learning circles that have deep time together. It's a long process. Anybody who has tried to get somebody else to make a donation or give a grant that is not already philanthropically minded, you know that this is hard work, and it's exactly the same for impact investing. So spending real deep time together, investing in um, individual conversations and small group conversations. And then another suggestion was connecting directly to entrepreneurs, build relationships with them, and invest your non-financial capital in your financial investments. If you meet the people that are doing the work, then you will feel more excited about it. This is exactly the same as having a site visit with an amazing grantee, that you feel more inspired to do this work. And if you bring friends onto that, that they also can feel inspired and feel really good. And do more. Alicia, anything to add to meaning that you haven't already gotten from wonderful Clara at Heron. Mm -hmm. No, I think that you hit the nail on the head. And um, to your last point, I think it's that whole concept of, um, you know, providing not just your treasure and your dollars, but your time and your talent um, to um, helping to foster, you know, this world of, of social enterprise and, um, you know, helping to further the the impact of nonprofits and, and those who are working um, in the social sector. It goes beyond, you know, financial capital. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go over sustainable livelihoods very quickly. I was very, 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 very sad to miss a session, but I was really fading after not having a lunch. Um, so this was one that I had wanted to get to, and I met up with some of the folks later, but community banks as innovators for neighborhood challenges. Um, this is just really quickly thinking about the future of work and, and a little bit dabbling also in racial equity and economic justice and structures that create opportunity instead of um, create opportunity for all, which is self-help's tagline, um, but instead of opportunity for a few. So there are some really interesting community banks that are partnering with fintech companies, thinking about new ways to envision access to capital, how we look at data, and reaching the un- and underbanked. So self-help is one of the darlings of this space. They partnered with a wonderful group called Runway Project to have a 2.1% insured certificate of deposit that has a minimum $500 buy-in um, and this capital, which is fairly low cost of capital to runway project, that capital is being used for friends and family-like rounds of funding for minority entrepreneurs who typically are coming from places where they don't have wealthy networks if you're thinking about friends and family and everybody you know is broke, it really does not help you to raise that initial funding. So they've partnered with self-help, and self-help has really been um, a stand-up in the community in thinking about 
how can we do things differently? How can we get the same kinds of opportunity that are afforded to people with means and get that to communities that haven't had that same kind of access? So this was exciting to see some of the ways that people are really digging in. They are a credit union. They have um, the needs of their members first, but also the, a very clear financial bottom line, but they're committed to working through the challenges that are enormous to make this possible. So that was, that was something that was particularly exciting for me, so I just wanted to step on, stop on that really briefly. And New Resource Bank is similarly doing things. They haven't done a CD, but they've done some really innovative um, methods of building capital access around um, less, less resource entrepreneurs, um, but they are focused on the Bay Area. So I don't care quite as much as somebody that has a branch in City Heights. Mm -hmm. And then education, I went to just one session, um, and one of the panelists opened it talking about one of their co-founders, Frida, who says, genius is distributed evenly by zip code, but opportunity isn't. Again, this deep thread of social and racial equity throughout the whole conference, even if we're technically talking about education. Um, so. I was excited to go to an income sharing conversation about future of finance. So this is something that we're doing at Mission Driven Finance, is looking at how can we create more equitable opportunity for people to grow their earnings potential? How can we look at finance mechanisms that allow people who don't have a good credit score to actually get into a technical training program and get a better job? This is a fascinating conversation, but very, very, very topical. Um, and in the interest of time, we'll just mention that I had it. And if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to me anytime, and I'm happy to have coffee. Um, so here's where we want to dig in. Alicia, you want to take over talking about racial equity for a bit? Sure. Um, so the, uh, the Kellogg Foundation in particular has been making um, a lot of strides in, in the space of racial equity and had a number of sessions that um, even, with, uh, even with Lauren and I tag teaming sessions, we probably could not have attended them all. But I would like to say um, that if any of these topics are of interest to you or if you go onto the SOCAP website and look at the agenda of topics, Many of them were recorded and can be found on YouTube. So you can just go in and search for um, business case for racial equity, for example, and there should be a Utah, YouTube video um, where you can see all of these presentations. Um, but it's a, a lot of, you know, across a number of the sessions that I attended, um, there was really this notion that it, it isn't enough to make a moral argument for racial equity. Um, we need to be able to communicate the economic impact of racism. And, and to one of the sessions that, um, that I found particularly interesting was, um, was moderated by the Kellogg Foundation and then um, sitting on the panel were um, two individuals who contributed to uh, a research uh, report. Um, in 2013 was the first one that came out called the Business Case for Racial Equity. And they're working on a new version um, that will be published in 2018. So we'll make sure to send that out to the SDIIN network. Um, but basically, the, the whole premise is that racial equity um, is a growth strategy. It, um, it contributes to workforce. And with, uh, you know, with, with, more, um, with more minorities in the workforce, we are looking at enhanced consumer spending. And, that has the domino effects, right, of tax revenues and economic growth. Um, I found it an interesting statistic to be that minority millennials are spending more than $65 billion each year, um, and they're influencing upward of a trillion dollars in total consumer spending. So there is significant purchasing power there, and, um, and, and that's, that's something to really take into consideration in addition to bridging the gap between um, their birth culture, their own children in mainstream society, they're also, um, you know, really at the forefront of consumer spending. Um, 
racism in the U.S. has left a legacy of inequities in health and education, employment, um, and other areas that, you know, really have impacted um, quality of life and, and achievement. Um, opportunities that were denied historically to racial and, and ethnic minorities at critical points in, in our nation's history have led to um, circumstances that um, many of our children of color are born into, um, you know, disadvantaged circumstances today. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the conversations were surrounding um, the responsibility that, that impact investors and those who are interested in, in, um, in equity and, and social justice really have a responsibility for knowing what is the historical context um, and understanding that the, the nation has been collectively damaged by collective decisions. Um, while at the same time, you know, looking at these, um, the, the realities and the statistics and, and the economic case for racial equity, um, start, start forward thinking on this. Yeah, absolutely. I might have gone out of order. Yep, get the slide somewhere. There we go. <laughs> I like this order better. Um, this is growing off of that, you know, historical context for inequity. I went to several sessions on neighborhood economics, this place-based work, because that's what we're doing here at San Diego Impact Investors Network. We're trying to catalyze place-based investment here. Um, so I really enjoyed this inclusive growth strategies for rapidly changing neighborhoods. I don't think I could have thrown another buzzword in there if I tried, um, but it was a really in-depth look at two cities, Detroit and Baltimore. And they were talking about Detroit, and it's an 83% black city, and they've had four rounds of displacement through policy. The, the black migration to Detroit was leaving the South and Jim Crow and trying to create a new life. And then they were not al allowed the same kind of opportunity because of housing policy, because of redlining, because of mortgage policies that said that this neighborhood populated by black people is less desirable, so they're going to be priced differently. They're not going to be able to build the same kind of equity and create generational wealth. So they've gone through three rounds of this, and I'm not nearly the same kind of policy expert as this woman was, but three rounds of this mean that there are four generations of people that have not had the same kind of access to growth opportunities. Um, and even from Capital Impact Partners, a friend of ours, they said minority developers don't have, the, have sufficient equity to expedite building projects for redevelopment in Detroit. They just don't have the, they don't own a million dollar house that they can add to their personal credit. They don't have then the capacity to grow off of um, all each subsequent real estate development that they do. So they've been primarily working on small retail programs and haven't been able to get the really big opportunities that other developers have had. Um, and there was a, a report from AEO, which I don't recall what that stands for, but something with entrepreneurship. Um, and they said, they did a deep study into what is actually driving wealth creation. Many people talk about home ownership as one of the best ways to build your personal credit and equity, and that's true. But what AEO found is that business ownership is actually a bigger driver of wealth creation, particularly in minority communities, than owning a home. And so how can we enable more minority entrepreneurs to create a more equitable society? Again, it's really hard to have that kind of um, business development if you don't have friends and family capital. So that's where it was great to hear from Jessica at the Runway Project about how they're getting impact investment capital to entrepreneurs of color so that they can start this cycle of wealth creation and, and continue to grow generationally. One other piece on neighborhood economics, this focus on Armenia 
I I know nothing about Armenia or knew nothing about Armenia until going to this, except that many Armenian Americans don't want to consider the Kardashians part of their tribe. Mm -hmm. Um, Things I don't know. But what was interesting in, in this discussion was Armenia was the site in, during the Soviet Union of nuclear missile tracking programmers. Pretty much all of the computer scientists for these nu- nuclear missile tracking uh, software stuff um, during the Cold War were in Armenia. So they have this heavy, heavy, heavy legacy of technology. But then after the fall of the Soviet Union, they hadn't had the same kind of opportunity. They fell back into being essentially an emerging market. Um, There were almost 100 incubators in Armenia, which is not a very large country. There were incubators left and right. And what the folks there found is that they weren't actually increasing the scale of companies. These companies were either failing or staying the same size. So they said, you know what? We've got to do something differently. And as we think about um, how to do the same things in San Diego, we're not an emerging market with nuclear missile tracking programmers, um, but we do have some similar pieces, and this skill set is absolutely um, transferable from Armenia to any place-based initiative. You just need to think about what are the key differentiators. What they What they landed on is creating an accelerator with very clear objectives that you need to be advancing global or community good, as well as it have a desire to scale. And then they paired that accelerator with a fund to grow Armenian companies, and this was anchored by the UN Development Project. But then it came down to, how do you fund this? How do you build a fund to grow companies? And this is where a, an Armenian-American philanthropist who works in the Bay Area said, you know what, I am Armenian. I care about Armenia. It's kind of irrational. I have never been there. Um, but this is where my people are from, and I feel a, a sense of connection to that. And she said, we can capitalize on this irrational affection that we have for an impact segment or an area. So she tapped into the Armenian diaspora and found, as she called them, diasporan philanthropists who care about this area and said, can you provide capital to grow our homeland? And this is just a very interesting thing for me to think about what are, what are those motivations? How can we pull on the heartstrings of people to then pull on their purse strings and unleash good in our local space? A lot of the time, it is not thinking about the bottom line. The bottom line will come, but the initial motivation comes from that emotional connection. One other piece is that they said, The venture capital approach from Silicon Valley does not fit in emerging markets. And that was another kind of unspoken trend, but that this fixation in the general American public on the VC approach to things was not not at all a darling at SOCAP. He said, these structures do not create the society that we want. How can we think differently about this? that in Armenia, they partnered with a Silicon Valley hub, and so they have mentorship opportunities with Silicon Valley companies, but they said they were very clear in not building the exact same structure from Silicon Valley in Armenia. So just some thoughts there. And I, I already managed to talk about the local ecosystem investing for economic justice because that was where I got to hear from Runway Project the most. So clicking back through to where I was supposed to be, (laughs) impact investing, what's happening? So it's actually, it was actually a perfect segue, Lauren, this this way, because you were finishing up that last part of the conversation talking about sort of um, place-based philanthropy. And a lot of the, a lot of the sessions that I went to really um, focused on how can foundations be innovative, and one of the session titles is called It's Not Your Grandfather's Philanthropy, um, and that session was, um, was really interesting. It was, it was a panel that uh, consisted of 
uh, the leaders of the Lumina Foundation, Sturgeon Foundation, Encourage, and then it was moderated by Deborah Schwartz from the MacArthur Foundation. And um, a lot of the conversation was, again, to my point before, was really leveraging the community voice and, um, and digging into what are the, the root causes of, of issues that are in the communities in which um, you're looking to invest. And the best way to identify that is to actually get involved and engaged in the community and to bring community members to the table where you can learn from them and hear firsthand of, um, of you know, what the, the needs and the issues are, but then also hear, listen to them propose solutions and, um, and, and move together from there. So Kelly Ryan is the um, executive director of Encourage, which is a foundation in central Wisconsin, and she talked a lot about this idea of user-centered philanthropy. Um, stating that it really begins and ends with the people in the community. And um, in, in, her, in her region in particular, um, years ago there was dependency on a single industry, and that was manufacturing. And when, when jobs were lost as a result of you know, manufacturing moving out of, out of that region, um, philanthropy really had to take a hard look at you know, what, what, is, what is happening, how do we, you know, Philanthropists at that point had sort of a diversion, diversion to risk, really, but realized that they needed to think beyond traditional philanthropy and to think beyond having, you know, just a regular um, grant cycle where, where organizations can apply for a grant and then the foundations review it and then they decide who they want to grant money to, but really engaging the community and the, leveraging the community voice way before um, before the investment process even begins. And so, um, you know, pipeline really begins with the people who are in the community, and Kelly had sort of five tenets for how, um, how, how philanthropists and impact investors can look at this in, in regions, um, you know, all throughout the country and really probably throughout the world. Um, so the first tenet is sharing the power with the community, making sure that there is not this... Um, this uh, sort of power struggle and trying to trying to um, even the playing field and to make sure that everybody at the table has an equal voice. Um, prioritizing the relationship between the foundation or the, the between the funder and the community, um, including all points of view and all sources of knowledge that are you know that are in the community, but then also coming from stakeholders, um, not not just individuals um, within the community, but from local businesses and associations, and other nonprofits, and the funding community as well. And then to test solutions early and often, not to identify one solution and, and just jump all in, but to um, sort of take a, a, a lean startup um, mentality and process to it. Look at all different solutions that, that are being presented from all different stakeholders. And, and test them and iterate and, um, and collectively come up with, with the best solution. Um, another area of the impact investing um, session that, that we focused on was this idea of corporate impact investing, um, that it really is an opportunity for, for social impact as well as a business opportunity. There was a really great, um, a really great session that I went to that the conversation um, among uh, Kai Bond, who is with um, Comcast Ventures and NBC Universal um, Entity and the Catalyst Fund, who really has paved the way in corporate impact investing, um, as well as Suzanne D. Bianca from um, Salesforce Foundation. She's the chief, she is the chief impact um, officer there. And then Aaron Riley from Twilio, which is a, a, a startup that has had um, a lot of really great success and is very community focused. Um, most of them are doing, and, and all of them strongly encourage, um, the Pledge 1% model, um, which is, uh, is, is contributing 1% of profit to the social sector and engaging employees in volunteerism. Um, a lot of the work that we do at Mission Edge and that we're trying to, um, to really uh, sort of promote in the community is this idea of, of going beyond charity and having, um, you know, from the corporate perspective, engaging your employees in 
different ways in which they can um, they can get engaged with with philanthropy and with um, with community members. So all three of these organizations are doing that in that they're not just investing in the social impact space, but they are um, they're also engaging engaging their workforce in in creating the social impact. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about trends in impact investing for years, probably. <laughs> Happy to share more if anybody has um, has questions or wants to know more about those those corporate impact sessions. Yeah, so if you um, chat into the online portion, you can ask us questions if you'd like. Um, but one of the grand challenges of the good capital projects as we mainstream impact investing is what they call enabling the entrepreneur. And that's something that both Alicia and I care a lot about. Um, as an intermediary for me, as a support agency for Alicia, these are things that we're always thinking about. So it was great to hear from peers across the country and in other parts of the world as well. Um, I went to an awesome session called Building Trusting Entrepreneur well, actually, it wasn't called that. It was called something else. But it was all about building trusting entrepreneur and investor relationships. Um, there is sometimes outsized due diligence. Um, an early stage social enterprise was her husband is a mergers and acquisitions specialist that worked on the Google acquisition of YouTube. And she said, their due diligence process was faster and less painful than mine for a very small investment in an early stage social enterprise. Is this make sense? We need to think about how much effort we're causing our entrepreneurs, our investees, or even our grantees to go through um, to create impact. Because all of the hoops that we make folks jump through means that that's hours that they're not focusing on running their business, getting to scale, um, generating revenue. So ADAP Capital ran this panel, and they also ran a session. They had an open room where social entrepreneurs could pitch to them during SOCAP, and they picked two in the span of three days um, to invest, invest in. And they swear by a four-hour due diligence model. Um, so that was really fascinating to hear from to think about what, what are those things that we can do from a due diligence perspective. Um, and uniformly talking to entrepreneurs, the things that they liked the best from investors that they would call their favorites were helping set the right KPIs, um, having reasonable reporting requirements, not trying to measure how many pieces of paper they printed or how many um, very small, not relevant to the mission, but think about how can we get the information we need to feel good about our investment and still enable this entrepreneur to keep doing that work? Um, and then encouraging candor, recognizing that there is a funding power dynamic, um, but being really clear with each other and being friendly. Um, and, of course, introducing investors to fill around. That is great. This helps you to make, as an investor to make sure that your, the company you've invested in is growing and um, has the capital it needs to reach the goals that you also are invested in. Um, and to, just like we were talking about with the corporate impact investing and some of the other trends is that think about activating your other connections, your other capital that you have um, to help these organizations succeed. So that's, that's all we, all of our biggest takeaways. If you have any questions, I'm going to unmute us. I'm going to try to unmute us. So instead of having a chat in, now is the time that you can just chime in, um, speak up, and share if you have a specific question or something that you'd like to hear more about. There's no question. I can see all of your names, so I can also call on you and say, hey, what do you think? Hello. 
So, Lauren, I don't know if you're Connie. Connie. Hi, Connie. Hi. I I don't have a question, but I I really want to thank you for putting you and Alicia for putting this uh, uh, presentation together and for investing the time in SOCAP. I I haven't been able to go for a few years, but I can um, see through your comments and insights that the field continues to advance, and it's very inspiring. Thank you. Yes, it is very inspiring, and it wasn't until I was putting together some of these notes and formalizing all of the thoughts from three and a half epic days that <laughs> I realized how much similarity there is between impact investment and grant making. Some of these yeah. things that we're talking about, um, trusting entrepreneur investor relationships, I'm like, oh, while I was in that session, I didn't even think that this is the same as philanthropy and nonprofits having real conversations. But it is. It's the same work. Yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you very your, much. You're welcome. To your point about the field has been growing, um, I have, I'm not usually one to pick up anniversary booklets, but SoCap put together this lovely little book about 10 years of money and meaning, and I have a copy of it. It's actually great. Um, I was reading it at 6 o'clock this morning. Um, but if anybody would like to see it, we'll keep it in our office here in the shared grant makers mission driven finance space. Should I call on the other name that I see and recognize? Nancy O'Leary? <laughs> Nancy, any thoughts? You know, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um the the one thought that I had, you made a comment about um, venture capital, and which is of course the space that I am um, in. I actually was about to email uh, you and Alicia an article um, that uh, came up on my on my radar that. At the same time SOCAP was going on, there was a venture capital conference going on like right around the corner. <laughs> and oh, really? the, article, the article that I have in front of me that I'll, I'll share says, doing well by doing good, more financial <laughs> investors consider, quote, impact investing. Hmm. And this article was written by Battery Ventures, which is a very well-known um, venture capital firm, and they actually had a um, conference through the National Venture Capital Association called The Future of Impact Investing. Oh. Um, Clara Miller from um, F.B. Heron was there, and this was going on virtually in parallel with SoCal. Right. Oh. Sort of crazy. So, yeah. yeah. So I just think that it's, you know, super interesting, right, that even though the venture capital space, um, for many, you know, sort of an evil, is like the evil empire, um, it, you know, this is now, you know, sort of coming, you know, to the forefront uh, for them in, in really a venture capital world that really is focused on financial returns, yeah. right? Um, so it looks like, um, and I'm happy to, you know, forward this again, Battery Ventures um, just wrote this quick article um, on who was attending and sort of what the, what the mentality is, um, whether we can sort of blend this financial and social um, return. So, yeah. Even, yeah I think even, that's right on point with, you know, this is a mainstreaming movement, and back to Bain's point, that we're going to need to figure out new ways to invest in mainstream things. So adding impact across asset classes is going to be what we're exploring in the next 10 years. That VC for impact is going to be a thing. Um, but venture capital in and of itself is not necessarily the answer for all of the problems that we face. It's still going to be 
targeting a certain type of company, certain parameters that make sense in the, um, for venture capital to work, but we can still start layering on impact as a lens. Right. Thanks, Nancy. That's great thought. Um, awesome. Want to be mindful of time. It is 9:30. I know some people have a have a very important meeting at the San Diego Foundation to go to. Um, but if you have any any final thoughts, feel free to contact either me or Alicia or Megan um, or chime in right now. I see Megan. Um, asked a question that is similar to, to Nancy's comment. I think it was their typical profile of attendees. Huh. Um, no. And did you see people new to the idea of social capital either normally played in finance or grants? And I have to say I was really encouraged by the diversity of attendees at SOCAP. Mm -hmm. um, there were um, certainly, you know, people who are, are practitioners and working in the nonprofit and social enterprise sector. Um, there were a number of funders from foundations and corporations there. And then there were also a lot, I met a lot of people who are working in um, sort of the, the financial consulting space, so fund man managers and asset managers who are starting to get questions from some of their clients um, asking about, you know, social impact and how they can, you know, diversify their portfolio so that they can make sure that they are, um, you know, at least putting part of their their investments into social good. So I was I was very encouraged by um, by the diversity set because I think that you really do need all different types of stakeholders at the table to mm -hmm. move this 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 movement forward. It can't just come from you know one one population or another. Completely agree. So yeah, there was not a typical profile of attendees. There was every which manner of dress. Um, <laughs> And it was shocking. Um, but I think to Megan's second question, did you see people who are new to the idea of social capital? Um, I ended up spending an hour and a half with my step-grandma, who I haven't seen in 14 years. Um, and she is an executive director of a family foundation now. This is new. Um, but she, she's um, been playing with the idea of activating more of their grant capital for impact investing. So yes, there are absolutely people who are still um, digging in and exploring how they can do this. They're not necessarily experts in the field yet. So great. Great question, Megan. Great comments, Tani and Nancy. And thank you all for being here. Thanks, everybody.